Are you in the market for some firepower? Because I've got plenty. This is the P-63 King Cobra and we're in Rexburg at the Legacy Flight Museum taking a look at one of the most unique uh, artifacts remaining from World War II. Now there's not a lot of flying ones that exist of the King Cobra but this one definitely is and also what we have of this aircraft is sort of an amalgamation of the C and the A model which is really cool because we can point out the different aspects to it. Now big thank you here of course to the museum and if you ever go to Idaho do check it out because it's an absolutely fantastic collection with a lot of flying exhibits as well. And big Thank you here also to all the supporters and crowdfunders for making Inside the Cockpit possible because it is 100% community funded. And big thank you here also to sponsor Fred B for making this episode possible. Now with the King Cobra then, let's start up up front with the propeller. It's an Aero Products propeller, a diameter of 3.5 meters with a low pitch of 24 and a high pitch of 60 degrees. Now behind the propeller, we have the engine, right? No, we don't. This is a King Crowbar. The engine, in fact, sits all the way back in the fuselage behind the pilot. And there's an extension drive shaft that runs from the engine all the way to the propeller, rotating it. What we have instead up front here is heavy firepower. First of all, we're starting with two 12.7 by 99 millimeter machine guns. Those are, of course, the famous 50 cal and uh, you have 250 rounds in each. And now you're going to wonder, well, that doesn't sound like too much heavy firepower. I mean, yes, of course, it's a Madus and you have two of them, but that doesn't sound like much. Well, we have a 37 in here as well. Yes, a 37 by 145 millimeter rimmed cannon. In the Aero Cobra and then later on in the King Cobra, we have the M4 cannon and then later in stages the M10 cannon, which had a higher rate of fire and also bolstered the ammo count to 58 rounds. So you have 58 rounds of 37 millimeter in here, which a single hit should do enough to take down an aircraft. What we also have is, of course, the front wheel. Uh, this is a tricycle landing gear and although you have differential braking, this wheel will swivel and facilitate easy taxi and also a good all-round view from the cockpit on the ground, making taxi very easy. And that swings in backwards here. And now you can also start seeing the reason why the engine isn't up here, because the cannon and the weaponry is up here and the gear is down here. There is simply no room for the engine. What you also have is the oxygen cylinders for the pilot and there is a small armored plate behind the propeller as well uh, to protect this frontal installation and additional armor further back towards the pilot as well. And you'll notice that in the King Cobra and as well in the Aero Cobra, armor is a big feature of the aircraft. It is some of perhaps even the most heavily armored aircraft of World War II as a single engine fighter that came out with that armor factory stock without having it retrofitted like for example some of the uh, later uh, Focke Wolf 190A models that specifically were converted to have more armor around them. Coming closer then to the cockpit we have these intakes right here we have the oil cooler intake on the inside and we have the uh, radiator cooler on the other side this is an inline engine so you do need that liquid cooling and that is of course mirrored on the other side as well. Inboard or outboard of that rather we have a water injection tank that is also mirrored on the port wing 25 gallons in the system providing you a wet run for about 15 minutes as we move along the leading edge There's a gun camera installed right here. You can of course see the gear below the uh, the wing that swings in inwards towards the fuselage and that starts giving you also a a, an indication of some of the limitations with the King Cobra in terms of range. There is now a fuel tank outboard of the gear that sits round about here-ish and it has 63 gallons. That is of course mirrored on the port wing but that's all the fuel you have. You have 126 gallons in the aircraft. There's no aux tank, there's nothing. And that limits you basically to missions of an hour, maybe an hour, 15 minutes. And the range of the King Cobra is really its Achilles heel. Now, it's a good aircraft, and the range wouldn't have been an issue, for example, in the European theater. And of course, the Soviet Union took care of these machines as well, and they really, really appreciated them. But for America, I mean, we were flying missions in the Pacific and in Europe as escorting uh, strategic bombers, and there you really need that range, and the King Cobra just wasn't made for that. And you can now wonder, why didn't they just expand the fuel tank outwards towards the wingtip? 
uh, sorry, the wingtip and the leading edge. Well, the thing is, because the King Cobra also featured a gun port, which isn't installed here on the wing, the ammunition belt would go all the way along the leading edge to here, where you see this little uh, covering plate that you could remove and then uh, rearm the guns as well in the gondola that is pushing from below. And this is an artifact from the development of the King Cobra. Initially, she was supposed to have two machine guns in the wings, and then that was done away with because it was just too complex and there was not real enough room. And then the Army Air Force demanded that it was to be put back in, but the wing had already been fixed up with the internal layouts. There was no room, so they fixed that gondola with a single machine gun. So you can see sort of a little bit of the complication during the development there that happened with the compromises that were uh, initiated throughout the development of the aircraft. Now, at the wingtip, of course, like I said, the covering plate for the belt-fed machine guns, if they're mounted in gondola, we have navigational lighting as well. And then we come to the large aileron. This is metal covered but it doesn't have a trim trap on, on the aileron. And then we have the flap right here. Carburetor air intake that you see on top, now that's an A model carburetor air intake, since the C model would generally be more rounded. Now coming to this area of the aircraft, we finally get to the engine. What we have here is of course the good old Allison V1710-93 or-117 engine. Right here, dash 117. This produces, with its two-speed, two-stage supercharger, uh, you can go up to a maximum of 1,800 horsepower. However, at that point, you're really running at more emergency power. You have to crank her up all the way for 3,000 RPM and 75 inch on uh, your manifold pressure if you're running her wet, closer to 60 if you're running her dry, so without the water injection. And um, you can only hold that power setting for so long. So you're dropping it down for combat power with the RPMs and also the manifold pressure. And then, of course, if you're going to cruise, you're sitting more along the lines of 2300 RPM and 30 inches on your manifold pressure. What we have with the aircraft as well is, of course, the old tank that is installed here, as well as the um, coolant header tank that is installed further front. Coolant header tank, 15 gallons in the system, and the old tank, roughly 10 gallons in the system. And uh, there's also a protective plate behind the engine, protecting the engine, and then further armor towards the pilot as well, giving you once again a hint at the parameters that were installed in the aircraft. You, of course, also have the electrical generator, that is installed here for the electrical power of the aircraft as well. Then coming further towards the tail, uh, we of course have the mast antenna and so on and so forth. And what you would typically see here now on an Aero Cobra, especially with the C variants, are also ventral fins. But as you can see, they're not installed there. Um, initially, what was uh, a problem with the King Cobra is that it had directional instability and also spin recovery wasn't that great. So this ventral fin was installed and that did away with the majority of the problems. Coming then to the tail, very conventional setup, uh, although it's of course a raised tail simply because of the tricycle landing gear. We have an elevator, which is in fact fabric covered in this model and also the uh, rudder that is fabric covered as well. We have a variable trim tab there, navigational light of course at the end as well. And then on the port side, we also have a variable trim tab for your elevator. Coming then to the tail end on the fuselage on the port side, we have a radio control panel, simply because the radius would be fixed right here. There is no room behind the pilot. Usually the radius would be right, sitting right behind the pilot, but that's not the case here. And the IFF system would be installed next to the engine, just above it. Coming then further towards the fuselage, well, I already spoke about the engine, so let's talk about the construction a little bit. The aircraft goes uh, from 6,500 pounds all the way to 10,000 pounds fully loaded. And if it, depending on how you set her up, of course, for the missions, and since it's an American aircraft, it is also set up as a semi-monarch construction. Flap here again, and then we have the aileron, and you can also notice here there's no variable trim tab on the aileron. There's only a fixed trim tab, and one of the complaints that actually existed about the King Cobra was there was no uh, variable trim tab for the aileron, at least uh, one of the complaints that American pilots had. Although American pilots generally appreciated this machine, it's just that America didn't have really a use for this aircraft. Pitot tube underneath there. And now let's start talking about some of the weaponry while we also take a glance here at the landing light. So you had, of course, the frontal weaponry that I already spoke about, and then you have the side weaponry right here. Um, well, it's a drop tank right now, 75 gallons. But what you could have is that wing-mounted 50 cal, a single one in a gondola with 200 rounds belt-fed 
towards the uh, wingtip. And then on the center line, what you could have is a conformalish aux tank that would be not actually built into the aircraft, but because it's in a fairing that very much sits underneath the aircraft, conformally mounted, that's why I said, I said it's a conformal fuel tank, uh, 65 gallons there, extending the range just slightly for the aircraft. Uh, and you could also, of course, mount bombs. Now, underneath the fuselage, you could mount anything between 300 to 500 pounds, a single one there. And on the wingtips, if you wanted to go fighter bomb, you can install another 500 pound bomb. And that brings us to an end on the outside. Now, let's jump inside. One take! All right, let's jump into the King Cobra. A big thank you here to the Legacy Flight Museum for this fantastic access and all crowdfunders and channel supporters for making this trip possible. In typical fashion, we will go through this clockwise. The Legacy Flight Museum have this aircraft in immaculate condition and you'll enjoy getting to see her ins and outs here, that's for sure. Starting out then on the left hand side, on your lower three o'clock position you will find the rudder trim control as well as the elevator trim wheel. Just to the right of that, the fuel booster pump switches and also the flap release switches here. As we move forward, we find our door handle to open and close the side door just like on a car. The P63 is somewhat of an oddity in this regard just like the Aero Cobra before it. Then we have the window crank handle for the door window. Yep, once again just like an old school car. And then we have the throttle on the throttle quadrant with an integrated push to talk button for the SCR 522 VHF radio or the SCR 274 set. The mixture control is here with the propeller pitch control as well. And then we have the friction control for the quadrant's handles. And then finally, we have the emergency door release to bail out. So right below this, past your left leg, we find the fuel tank selector, as well as the bomb arming lever, and then the centerline bomb release lever. You don't want to get those too confused, I'm sure. Moving towards the center, let's look up first. Here we have a mirror that provides some additional rearward visibility, even though in the Air Cobra it's already quite good. The GoPro mount there is not World War II spec, just in case that needs to be made clear. Then we have the reflex gun sight sitting above the central instrument board. And now we will swing down to the left hand side of the central instruments. First up we have the master switches operating an assortment of systems from weapons, pitot tube, and battery and generators. Then we have the ignition switch, as well as the landing gear switch and the carburetor air intake switch, as well as a wing bomb release and salvo switch. Above this we have a dual ammeter voltmeter, a clock, as well as the machine gun charging handle for the left hand 50 cal machine gun. And then we also have the loading handle for the 37 millimeter Idaho potato launcher. Shifting towards the center, just under the gun sight, we find the main instruments and elements of the six pack. We start with the altimeter and feet. We have a compass, a heading direction indicator, and the gyroscopic attitude indicator. Then further down, let's check out the speedometer in miles per hour, a vertical speed gauge, a turn and slip gauge, and the radio magnetic indicator. Then we come to the engine control dials, starting with the manifold pressure gauge, the RPM gauge, as well as a triplex oil temperature and fuel and oil pressure gauge. Then we have the fuel gauge, as well as a gearbox oil pressure gauge. And then we have two coolant temperature indicators. Finally, the assortment of switches here are for the engine and cooling control. This was slowly becoming the norm from the more laborious levers and cranks in early aircraft, but interestingly, the comprehensive standardization of the P63 towards the electrical system on this does contrast somewhat with other single engine fighters of the time. Moving to the right, we then find the, well, the oxygen pressure gauge and the cannon charging handle, as well as the right hand machine gun charging handle. Straight below this, then we have the oxygen flow indicator, the carburetor air temperature gauge, as well as the G accelerometer. Finally, on the center right, an additional oil temperature indicator for the supercharger, 
the SCR695 radio detonator push buttons to destroy the set in case of being downed in enemy territory. This radio set does include the IFF system, making detonation somewhat preferable in such cases. We also have an instrument lighting switch, the master switches for the radio and compass, and then the radio filter for ground-to-air communications with integrated radio tone signals for navigation. Basically, there are singular acoustic tones in Morse code that are being automatically transmitted to the pilot, providing him with a guidance whether to stay on course or to steer to the left or to the right for a specific direction. Before we hit the right-hand door, let's look down and check out the manual hand crank for the landing gear. And then finally on the door, we have a handheld signaling lamp, another window crank, as well as the flight record and map holder stowage. Just to the far right of the pilot seat, we also have the audio volume switch and behind him doubling as the headrest, a medkit. In the lower central position nestled between your feet, that control of course the rudder pedals for your control, we find the parking brake for the aircraft, as well as the radio console. And finally, the control stick for pitch and roll control. On top, we find the release switch for bombs or the firing button for the cannon. It depends on how you set up the aircraft and what systems are engaged. And finally, we have the trigger to let fly on either your caliber 50 or the caliber 50 and the potato slinger cannon. Big thank you here to the crew from the Legacy Flight Museum in Rexburg, Idaho. They do have a fantastic collection of planes that are basically all of them are maintained in flight worthy condition and they are very proud to show them off. You should definitely go and visit them and let them know we sent you. The team at the museum is great, dedicated and extremely friendly. After filming we actually got to stay with them a bit and volunteer in cleaning the aircraft and got to see the arrival of Old Yeller, the famous yellow P-51 that still holds the record for the fastest US coast to coast transit for a single engine piston aircraft at 5 hours and 20 minutes. So that was really cool. Big thank you here to the community and all the crowdfunders for making Inside the Cockpit possible. It is 100% community funded, so it is thanks to you that this video exists. As always, I wish all of you a great day and see you in the sky.